Hi friends, it's Deanna Willison with our Blooming Catholic Life and it is May 13th. When I'm filming this, I have no idea if that's going to have um, any impact on the Lexio Divina, but I will ask you if you have prayed your rosary today. Don't forget you need to pray the rosary every day. Let us begin as we always do with the Signum Crucis. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Sume glorioso Deus, illumina tenebris cordis mehi et da mihi fidem rectum, spem certain et caritatem perfectum, domini ut fatuum tuum sanctum et verax mandatum. Amen. I wonder what ever happened to the folks who used to love to come on here and um, try to correct my Latin. I don't think my Latin's gotten that amazing. Um, I hope I haven't chased them away. I hope my mispronunciation does not chase you away. I mispronounce things all the time, but I do always try to grow in love and faith with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. Let's begin our verses. As always, I'm going to read them and pause ever so briefly in between them, but you should be pausing the video. Take all the time you need to write in your journal, draw a picture, draw down, write down the words and phrases, look up words, stop, do whatever you need to do between the three readings to help you go more deeply into the scripture and see how God is using this scripture to speak to you in your life today. And as he was coming to him, the devil threw him down and tore him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and cured the boy and restored him to his father. And all were astonished at the mighty power of God. But while all wondered at the things he did, he said to his disciples, Lay up in your hearts these words, for it shall come to pass that the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. So remember, friends, this was as Jesus had come down from the Mount of the Transfiguration, he was met by a multitude of people and a man crying out, knelt before him and begged him to save his only son who was beset by an unclean spirit. And they had said that the disciples had tried to heal the boy and were unable. And so Jesus said, bring hither thy son. And as the man was coming to him, the devil threw him down and tore him. So he was assuming the boy was coming with him, right? So as the man was coming to, to him, the devil threw the boy down and tore him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and cured the boy and restored him to his father. And all were astonished at the mighty power of God. But while all wondered at all the things he did, he said to his disciples, Lay you up in your hearts these words, for it shall come to pass that the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. And as he was coming to him, the devil threw him down and tore him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and cured the boy and restored him to his father. And all were astonished at the mighty power of God. But while all wondered at the things he did, he said to his disciples, Lay you up in your hearts these words, for it shall come to pass that the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Now, friends, we know the ending of this story. We know of Christ's passion death and resurrection. So we get what he's saying, but it tells us in the next passage that they understood not what Jesus was saying because it was hidden from them. Um, it's easy for us to see literally what Jesus is, is predicting here, that he's trying to warn them is coming, but they weren't. But again, hindsight is twenty twenty. When they look back and the Holy Spirit has come upon them at Pentecost, they're going to be able to understand that then. And why? Because they're probably not ready to understand it yet. And we have that so many times in our own spiritual life. Like we have moments when we go to Jesus and the devil throws us down and tears at us, doesn't he? He does. And you know, sometimes when you start a new Bible study or a new devotion that is particularly holy, you can tell sometimes you're really being spiritually attacked and you know this. And what do you do? You just get up and go to Jesus all the more, right? Because Jesus will rebuke the unclean spirit and cure you and restore you to the Father. And so many people, this is true. This is true for so many people. I don't know if this is every generation, but it was this generation. And I definitely see this a lot in 
pardon me for the expression if you don't like it, the baby boomer generation had a lot of trouble with authority. And so I've seen in them a, a big trouble in going to God the Father. There just seems to be something there where he's seen as very authoritarian and they're afraid to approach him. Even when they go to him, there's there's the spirit of the world saying, no, challenge authority, question authority, man. Sorry. And and they have trouble going to him. And that is that spirit of the world telling them not to do it, right? And But Jesus is there. Jesus as the brother, the friendly guy who's there, who we say that he doesn't judge you, although he lets the law judge you pretty easily, right? And he tells you to go and sin no more normally. This is not that. This is a, a possession. But it is here. He cures the boy and restores him to his father. So that is kind of like a go and sin no more. The boy wasn't sinning on his own accord. He was possessed by this unclean spirit. But God Sorry, God uses Jesus to cure this boy and restore him to the Father. Mm. So many people, they're able to go to Jesus. These people, they were able first to go to the disciples. And the disciples, they weren't able to help him. And that happens sometimes. I think we talked about that earlier um, in this series on Luke chapter 9. Sometimes you go to a priest or a brother or sister or brother and sister in Christ or you go to someone who you think is going to help you, a parent, um, an aunt, a school teacher, and you go and they don't hear you or they're not able to help you in the way that you wanted. Sometimes they may rebuke you. They're not understanding what you're saying. And for a lot of people, that is going to get them to turn around and walk away from the Father. So we do have to be careful of our words. We do want to say to people, go and sin no more. We want to let them know that it's a sin. Um, usually, I think they know it's a sin when they're doing it, but but not always. Okay, I'll give you that. Not everyone does. Um, to have that compassion on them, to actually look at them and see them as a child of God and to say, go and sin no more. That can be hard because you are saying that they are sinning, but sometimes it's easier to approach someone, whether they're the incarnated God or or an adopted spiritual son or daughter of God. Sometimes we are the first people that get approached and how we treat people does matter. And so Jesus, it says right here, you know, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring hither thy son. And so that. It doesn't sound like the friendliest approach. Everybody talks about how Jesus is your bestie and he's so easy to approach and he's so kind and gentle with everyone. He's not always. It doesn't sound like that. This, if I heard it, even if he was really talking to the unclean spirit, but he was looking at me, that'd be a little challenging, wouldn't it? And so it's difficult to see that a person has sinned and to see their sin and be repulsed by it, but not repulsed by the person, but have compassion on the person, even if you're revulsed by their sin or the condition that you find them in. You know, when they brought that woman in adultery to Jesus, it had to make him incredibly sad that she had been in adultery. He might have even, I, I can't really speak for Jesus, but if somebody comes to you in that state, you might be like, yeah, you know, <laughs> A little, little icky. I don't know that Jesus has that, but me as a human, I might have that reaction. But to be able to look at them and be like, like, you, you know what you did. Don't do it again. And that's so easy to say. Now, when Jesus says it to you, you're probably getting some grace. When I say it to you, I don't know that you're going to get graces from me, but I may say that I can pray for you. And in this case, it wasn't enough. The disciples did all that they could, and it wasn't enough. D- does that mean we shouldn't ask the disciples or our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for us? Absolutely not. Ask them to pray for you all the more. Say, take me to Jesus. Pray to Jesus for me. Have him send the graces on me. Just beg for more. Don't turn away. Beg for more. And keep saying it. You know, I had an instance in my childhood where... I needed help and nobody would listen to me. And I just had to keep saying it. And that really stinks. And it was horrible. But I knew the truth and I just had to keep saying it. And eventually the right people heard me and gave me help. And that help wasn't perfect. And I'll admit that here now. That help was not perfect, but it was help. And I know that my heavenly father saw me. And he did so much to protect me and to heal me. 
and so many other people that would have that one instance would have turned them against God and it didn't it made me cling to him to run to him even more time and time again to trust him more so many people it would cause them not to trust all I can guess is that I had people praying for me that I would continue to trust and it held me up I know my grandmother prayed the rosary every day especially on today and that really strikes me. You hear a lot of people when they tell you their conversion story or their reversion story or when they went deeper into the faith, a lot of times they're going to reveal a grandma that, that prayed a rosary every day for each grandchild. And I think in this day and age, we forget how much we need to value that grandmother um, and just that form of prayer. So many people think that you have to be in active ministry, by which they mean feeding people soup kitchens, working in this ministry, working at that merit ministry, volunteering hours at this or that. And those are all well and good, but we can't forget to pray, to take people to Jesus in our hearts and in our prayers and to lift up other people. Um, I've said on this channel again and again, you know, when I started this channel, I would tend to get angry and rail and you can't do this. And ah, why would he do this? And why would he do that? And what it comes down to is who is praying for that person? Do we pray for the synod? Do we pray for our bishops? Do we pray for our priests and deacons? Do we pray for the Pope? Um, I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more on Friday about praying for the Pope and a really great opportunity to do that. It's okay to say, I don't like what that person's doing. And I wish they were more traditional, or I wish they spoke with more clarity. But don't just wish. We're not throwing pennies in the water. That's just throwing money away. Lift up your hearts and souls in prayer to God. Let's just go with the blessing of Brother Leo. And again, I'll ask you to pray for me, and I will pray for all of you. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Benedicat tibi Dominus et custodia te. Ostendit Dominus facium sum tibi. Et miserator tui. Convertit Dominus vultum sum ad te. Et Dominus bonus det tibi pacem. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. God bless you, friends.